So um, mm -hmm. I have I haven't read too much about you because um, otherwise it would spoil the magic of it all. So um, can you tell us a bit about your background and how you got into music and and where you are now? Uh, just so yeah. people that know nothing about you can uh, drop in on this. No, there's no place like home. Basically, I was in this uh, rock and roll band for, you know, years ago called Span. And we, we were based in Britain. We moved to London and got signed to Island Records uh, back in 2001. And then we released, uh, as many rock and roll bands do, release one album, they get, they get dropped. Uh, but it was, a, it was a minor success, I would say, in Norway, uh, where we all came from. And we were all expats in, in London. Right. And so when that band kind of fell apart, uh, it was basically because of my vocal cords couldn't stand the strain of uh, having the strongest drummer in the universe. And we had to match, you know, guitar amps to that. Oh, yeah. mm. And the, I'm still playing with a drummer and he's still the strongest man in the world, but plays a lot more, you know, he, he's, he goes easy on the drums. Um, I was in different band constellations, started studying English literature and was, uh, I was just down a different path. And then suddenly I, I found myself very much immersed in, in African American and West African music and wanted to, to, to make something of it. And I just suddenly had this bunch of songs and I played it to, uh, some, some friends of mine in universal in Norway and they, they released it and then suddenly things started catapulting on now on my sixth solo album Six. so it's basically been a yeah basically been a very organic uh path from uh for me anyway from a rock and roll band via studying thinking you know being in the world uh releasing a very much like a what i seem to to look at as a as a soul album or someone trying to make a soul album but I'm still not sure whether I succeeded. And then I made the some other albums that are in the vein of like R and B, soul, pop music. Not too much rock and roll anymore though, but Okay. So maybe one. So going back to one. going back to your first, your time in London, uh with your first band, um yeah. signed in early two thousands, signed to uh Island Records. Was that your first experience in um in a large recording studio with producers and engineers. Yeah. I mean, we were used to, we had recorded some stuff with previous bands and, uh, and I was also like a session guitar player and, oh. and musicians on different things. So I had experienced like studio environments, but the span album was much where we had Gil Norton as a producer. Oh, right. Avian Bush engineer. Did you say Avian they... Bushby? Yeah. Oh, right. Yeah. He's been here before. Well, yeah. yeah. Hello, Adrian. <laughs> Hello, Adrian. <laughs> oh, that was cool. So which studio was that in? Did you? Where did you work? That was in, in St. John's Wood. In Rack. Oh, yeah, we know that. Yeah, cool. The API and uh, and we, everyone wanted to kind of work there, and they had this old Yamaha organ. You know, the first all of, uh, one of the first polyphonic synths. Oh, cool. In a month. Yeah, it was it was amazing. I mean, we lived there, we recorded there for the better part of you know, a couple of months. Maybe. Wow. It was just proper, proper, proper. Big session. Big session. And then sort of springing forward um, to your sort of solo stuff, you say you signed with Universal. Yeah. And how's that um, recording process been for you um, as a solo artist? What What's your, do you work in similar size studios in Norway? Uh, very different. Oh, right. I mean, the mo most of the first album was made in a, in a little shed uh, about the size of this, actually, this is the, I mean, two people in here, there's an old, there's an old garage okay. and you couldn't fit like a mini in here. Even. It, it's so small. And the, the, my first time was made basically made on a tiny Mac with Pro Tools LE on it. And just the microphone that came with the, with the M box. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, it was made with, with basically everything was, you know, I could, I could reach everything had a small keyboard and some some drummy things and a cello that i 
jugged. <laughs> I was just trying out different things and, and really discovering what I could do with Pro Tools um, just by myself. And then we, we took some of that material in and took it to a studio in, in Hoboken in New Jersey. Um, but that was like finishing touches. The most part of it was made. We, we released demos, but properly mixed afterwards. Um, I did work in a very swanky studio down in the Isle of Wight for oh, my yeah. third album. Um, with Paul Butler as the producer. And oh, that was, that was like, like it was back in, back in rack, but it was, uh, what for was the most name? part. So what was the name of the studio on the Isle of Wight? Uh, is it, uh, Chael Abbey? Yeah. 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 I know that one. Mike's been there as yeah. well. Cool. Nice. That's a... yeah. Nice. But for the moment, I've been like working with the uh, songwriters slash producers or even in here, just recording things in a rudimentary way and then, you know, touching it up with sending files to drummers, getting files back, just aligning things. Okay. So is your live performance, um, completely, um, separated from the writing process um if that makes sense does your your because your, you, you perform solo don't you i do i also perform with a band ah. uh, but it's because of financial reasons uh, it's kind of hard to get that band out of norway right well my fourth album is called humanoid that was more like an, a live album with a band recorded okay. in a um and that was that that album we kind of took on the road as as it was recorded because it was very much based around the live experience. Um, but for the most part, I would see if I play solo, it will be a, a an interpretation or even a, a translation of the studio versions. I try to not limit myself when I'm in the studio, and I can and I can if I want like an element, a sound element, I can just get it, you know, play a tambourine or whatever. It's very hard to do when I'm playing solo and my hands are all occupied to get out of the tambourine. Yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah. Cool. Think, um, so where are you at the moment? What are you, uh, what are you working on at the moment? Is this, are you in between records? Have you got a new one out? What's, what's happening? I mean, on October 6th, uh -huh. um, is, uh, mostly recorded in Los Angeles. I just went to LA last year, uh, or one stint in October and one stint in January this year to basically write some songs with people who are have good connections into film and TV. And the plan was just to write maybe one song in, in that one week of October that would could be used for like, you know, the end title song or whatever. Right. And we ended up with five really good songs that are very vastly different from anything I've done before. Um, and so I just wanted to book another week and ended up with five more songs. So it's, it's very, that was very much like, a, I've never worked that effectively and productively with anyone before, but right. I did with Neil, the people I wrote with. In, in so Neil I missed you there. Who, who did you write with? Sorry. I worked with a guy called Neil Ormandy. Oh, okay. Mancunian who lives in, in uh, Los Angeles right. and, uh, Guy called Abe Dirkner is very much like a work like at a mass destruction place, produce, produce, does production, engineering, plays great piano, you know, bass guitar, everything. So, works. were you working at their studios, their, their home setups? Yeah. Oh, right. Okay. That's interesting. And, and do you figure that very small? Very small. Similar size. So, is that uh, a direction you want to take things in to the more sort of, uh, cinematic filmscape type uh, production yeah in a way i kind of did it as an experiment just to broaden horizons in a way and and how to how to how to write how to compose music this is very much like a keyword writing session you have like seven archetypical storylines and wanted to write something that could fit any of these seven storylines, uh, which is a very cinematic way of thinking about writing songs. But it's very easy to 
make the connection to my own life within these or anyone's life within these seven storylines because they are all encompassing in a way so that was that was i wouldn't say i'm very much a cinematic songwriter but it it kind of worked it kind of broadened my horizons anyway oh right that's interesting so um um for all of our, our viewers and people who are into this thing, I have to ask you a bit about your um, setup, what you work with um, in your garage or, or your studio setup. Um, so you could give us a, a quick rundown on some kit and some stuff that you use, uh, uh, just because yeah, this is what we, this is what we like. Basically, what I've thought about is that I use I use Pro Tools still because it's the 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 door that I kind of know. Yeah, uh, it's in a uh, and but the one thing that I found that no, in my experience, no, um, any plugin can do is uh, a great mic. I have this, uh, this thing here. It's a Browner. That is an excellent, you know, condenser, large diaphragm mic, and uh, I run that into like a good preamp. I have a Chandler Limited. Uh, it was basically like a knee N73 clone, and it works really well. Almost never use any EQ on it because the mics sound fantastic. And I want you know the people who mixes my stuff to be able to have a like a big block of, of marble to kind of chisel out how art works from. So that was the main idea, and I I run that into a um into a purple audio sort of MC77, which is basically a, a uh, also a clone of a uh, Uri 1176 or 1176 and that goes pretty much straight into Pro Tools. I have other bits and bobs. I have some APRs and a lunchbox thing. Um, uh, it's a 512s and a 550 EQs. Um, and I do have some distressors. I must say I almost never use because I think that's a, it's almost like I've, I have them here, but, uh, I'm, maybe I'm going to sell them. <laughs> Give me a call. Cause they're really useful. <laughs> I will. <laughs> or maybe I'll just take your word for it and start using them. <laughs> um, and then that goes into, uh, what's this, uh, this, uh, it's a, it's a Fireface face UFX, like interface? RME, yeah. RME. And it's, it works like a charm. And, um, and that goes straight into Pro Tools and I use whatever EQ plugin that no, normally comes with Pro Tools. I'm really not into finding out a lot about plugins, but I'll, I'll, I'll use something that's usable for for like a, a rough mix and then send it on to someone who, who does better stuff who do you mixing yeah when you're talking about mixing um who do you use do you have go-to people or do you just uh, each project project leads on to a different person is do you have a you know what's your thing there i have a a guy that i've i've worked with for, for my last three albums normally that is called Bjarne Stensley, who's done tons of Norwegian stuff. He's a good friend of mine, great, great, all around, great guy to hang around with. Um, but this last album was mixed by a guy called Kevin Mintz, who I'd never met even. I just, uh, the, the people in LA wanted to use him, so I, you know, do it. Um, and it sounded absolutely amazing. That's good. <laughs> uh, with the mix process, do you get do you uh, do you do this sort of thing? Do you do a Zoom thing, or do you go uh, and attend the sessions um, to review the um, you know the uh, the changes? I would love to attend. I couldn't when the the thing was mixed in LA because oh, no. I, I have a couple of kids as well that I want to be an active dad to. Uh, but normally, I I will I will I will want to immerse myself in the process. But I found that it was also kind of good to hear someone else's take on these songs. Right. Like, scratch. It was, it was almost like I was, it was nerve wracking, but also very positive in a way to just let someone deal with these, these songs that are, you know, almost, I treat them almost like my kids. 
when when they're out they need they need to be you know they need to, to be autonomous and be dealing with other people in the world set free <laughs> <laughs> and so with your setup then uh how do you uh, go about recording your guitar there do you you uh go direct in and use um amplify modeling uh plugins or do you put a microphone in front of a an amplifier I use uh, one or two even. I had great results with with guitar liking to have uh, the kind of sweet spot uh, uh, fifty seven or other dynamic mic, and then put uh, put a condenser right, right next to it, and then a ribbon. Oh yeah, right, right next to that, and then just balance and try and sort out any face issues between the, the condenser and the and the the, the, the dynamic mic, and then. I'd slowly bring up the the ribbon, like a Rory or one two one. I'd, it's a it's a great mic for that. Yeah, I, you... but I, I use I'm used to Sigma, a Sontronic Sigma, that works absolutely fine. That's the same trick. It's at a fraction of the price. Ha, that's always useful. So that's cool. So when you send, you do send off. Do you make uh, decisions to sum all those mics together and and send one recording, uh, one file, or do you send all of your separate um, multi tracks off for for mixing? Uh, it kind of depends. With Bjarne, who I I know very well, and I normally attend the, the mixing process in person, I will just send all all three files. Uh, but it depends. Like sometimes it's really good to have a direct mic in or the direct signal into just straight into the interface, or whatever. And uh, see what we can get from there. Reamp stuff. I'm, I'm all for anything that sounds good. I'm not very uh, dogmatic when it comes to. Even though I'm a guitar player, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm not that dogmatic when it comes to. I mean, it's a, it's a very much like an Amish society. As many guitar players, they wanna, they wanna accept anything that's <laughs> that's made after 1960. In a way, it's, it's it is pretty strange. And I'm not of that mindset at all. Would you ever, do you ever see yourself uh, in the production role yourself as a producer? Um, and what qualities do you look for in a producer slash engineer? Yeah. I think that I've done some production work for oh, it. Right. Um, not too much. And I've always done it with someone who's more technically savvy than I am. So I can be like Gil Norton, sit sit with a coffee cup uh, or a jug with my feet on the mixer. I just be because <laughs> I I think I'm it it it'll be more like a musical director, when I, because that's that's kind of where I can contribute. I think with we should should maybe try and add some strings to this and maybe how about this piano part too. Uh, I think that's where I could I could work as a producer. I can do like bare minimum of technical things, but not too much. Um, and what I look for in a producer, I think it must be more than anything like a personal connection. Because if I have someone who I enjoy working with, I'll be better at whatever I do. I've, I've been fortunate enough to not work with too many being, uh, I, I've worked with so many good people that I've contributed and I've loved them uh, to bits. And that helps. But I've had the odd occasion where I've been thinking, you know, going to the studio now is a drag. And if I feel that way, then the result is not going to be any good. Right. But personal connection to me is more important than anything. 